Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to tonight's visiting artist uh, lecture by Professor Hannah Freeman. Uh, I just have a couple of announcements and then we will begin. Um, so first of all, my name is Dylan Collins. I coordinate visiting artist programming and the visiting artist lecture series with my wonderful colleague, Shalaya Marsh. Um, thank you to everybody for joining us uh, here live uh, in, the, in Block Hall at the Creative Arts Center. Also, thank you to everybody joining us virtually. So a couple things I'll mention about tonight's lecture. Uh, for those of us who are joining us, for those of you who are viewing the lecture in a virtual format, you can go ahead and put questions in the chat, and then I will kind of gather some of those things, and Professor Freeman can answer those uh, at the end of her talk. And then for those of you who are joining us tonight here inside of Block Hall, whenever, if you have questions at the end of the lecture, you can go ahead and come right up here to this wonderful microphone, and that way people at home, uh, those joining us virtually, can kind of hear the questions. Um, so um, the other thing, too, is please silence your cell phones as we begin this talk. Um, okay, so um, I'm just going to go ahead and read a few things for um, just some kind of considerations. Uh, next up for our visiting artist lecture series is McLean Fenstock, Contemporary Media and Video Art. So this is going to be in the Paul Massaros Gallery. Uh, the lecture and reception will be Thursday, November 4th at 5 p.m. in Block Hall. So please join us um, virtually or face-to-face -face for this wonderful um, exhibit, which will be the last one of fall 2021 of the Visiting Artist Lecture Series. So it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Hannah K. Freeman. Uh, Professor Freeman is a good friend and colleague. I will also mention that both of us went to the same small school in Illinois, um, which is really, you know, you never know where your fortunes will find you um, with friends and uh, fellow artists. So Professor Freeman graduated from Eastern Illinois University in 2013, summa cum laude, with a Bachelor in Fine Arts in Graphic Design and a minor in 2D Studio Art. Um, she earned her MFA from the University of Notre Dame in May of 2019 and has exhibited her paintings across the country from California to New York. Hannah is currently a teaching assistant professor of art at West Virginia University in the School of Art and Design. So thank you all. Please join me in welcoming uh, Hannah Freeman. Okay, so I'm good to take this off. Yeah. All right, thanks, Dylan. So as Dylan said, I'm Hannah. Um, I teach here in Painting and Foundation, so I see a lot of familiar faces out here. Now I don't see them as much because it's dark because of the lights. Um, but um, before we begin, I just want to say just thank you to Dylan for the introduction, also to Shalaya with help in the gallery, um, with all the phone calls that I was giving her about everything, even relating to like what typeface you use on the label. So um, thank you. Also thanks to the Visiting Artist Lecture Series Committee for offering me this opportunity in showing my work here and giving a lecture. Um, it's really exciting for me to be able to show my work here, like the actual work. Some of you have seen pictures of my work, um, but maybe not necessarily in person. Um, so that's really cool. Um, it's also really cool to be able to talk to you guys about my work. So. Um, yeah, thanks everybody for making this happen. Also, thanks to family and friends and my students for hanging in there with me this last week and a half. It's been a little crazy. So, you know, those classes that have ended short last week, the class in painting two that was canceled because I just needed to install. Um, hopefully, we feel like we're all back on track this week. Thanks for hanging in there with me. Um, and with this talk, I'm going to talk about um, kind of my trajectory through undergrad to grad to now to hopefully give you a sense where I started, um, my struggles, and then things that helped me along the way. But first, my, my journey starts as a kid, right? As probably um, many of us, many of our journeys start there. Um, I feel like I was a really shy child. I was kind of a hermit. I... I remember this, maybe I'm wrong on this, but I remember spending hours in my room doing my creative things that I would do in my room, like making things with beads or clay or drawing. This picture shows me painting. My grandma was a watercolor artist, so she got me these watercolor books that I wouldn't make a mess with. I just paint water on them and they turn colors. Um, but I didn't really paint after 
um, childhood. I didn't paint in uh, elementary school or middle school or high school that much. Um, I just had like the class project where I painted. Painting came later for me, but it definitely started in childhood. Um, you know, I was shy, I was a hermit, as I already said, so we should have known that I would become a painter later on. Um, but so I went through schooling. I was that student who, um, and that friend who, if anybody needed anything art related, a poster made, I was always that person that they would say, hey, Hannah, would you do this for me? Would you make this sign? Um, and I really loved lettering. I, I would spend hours like taking notes in class, like perfecting each letter that I was making, changing the way I wrote like my lowercase a's. So when I got to um, going into undergrad, figuring out what I was gonna do in college, I, I don't remember having a lot of like doubt. I just kind of thought graphic design. I love letter forms. I wanna learn more about graphic design. I'm just gonna go into that. So I went into that and I liked it, um, but I started to realize after my first painting course um, that I had in college that that's really where my passion was. So I kind of realized this, but I was already set to go to the graph design route, right? Graph design was a little bit more desirable, you know, in terms of the job market. So I decided to stick with graphic design, um, but I, I really wanted to continue painting too, because after that first painting course, I realized that I couldn't not paint. It was really frustrating at first when I started painting, but then I realized that that was like the one thing that started to make sense to me out of everything else. Um, so I decided to do both. I, would, I did graphic design classes during the day. I had a class conflict with painting, so I couldn't actually attend painting classes after um, painting two. So I just painted after I did design all day, painted at night, painted over the weekends. Um, and then I would catch up with design work late at night. So I was kind of working around the clock. I was a little stressed during this time frame, but it was worth it. Um, I learned a lot. Painting wise, in um, painting one, started off with still life painting as many of you do. And then um, as I went into painting two, I started to create my own still life setups, figuring out how I could make still lifes that would reflect me as a person, my story, or what I was interested in, but I really didn't have any type of content past that. I didn't know what I wanted my paintings to be about. I just wanted to paint. I just wanted to make things look like things and know how to make mix color, and I wanted to mix saturated color, so everything was like super saturated. Um, I would create these still lifes. I would take pictures of them, and then I would paint from the photos. I would project them like many of you do um, in, in Painting 3 here project the photos, trace them on, then paint back into them. So you can see up here, um, I was working pretty large scale. The two paintings on the far right were painted in painting two, and then the two on the left, um, advanced painting. We were required to, to do, as I remember it, um, larger scale. So I think the smallest I did um, in advanced painting was a two by four foot, but we were required to do six a semester. So that kind of like, I really had to learn quickly how to make progress really fast. Um, so I, I would project and paint from the photo. I started to realize though that the photo wasn't providing me all the information that I wanted to paint. I wanted to paint more detailed, more realistic, and I wasn't getting that from the photo. So as I started my journey on into um, advanced painting, I started to create still life setup. So I would create the actual thing in my studio. Um, and this was, I was encouraged to do this by my professor, shout out to Chris Kaler. Um, and because he, he mentioned like, okay, if you wanna really hone your craft and if you wanna get better, you have to look at the actual thing instead of the photo. So I started creating still life setups, um, just selecting things that I found interesting, right? I didn't, again, I didn't know what I wanted my paintings to be about. I just wanted to paint. So I selected things that I like to look at, things that I like the texture. So a lot of the objects were older, rusty, um, like in this one, I'm starting to realize now looking back over my work that this is wood grain, lichen, and you know, what, this was 2012, so what, five, five years later, that became like a major part of my work and I didn't really anticipate that back then. So I was just selecting things that I liked um, painting from life, drawing from life, 
So I would paint, this is hard to see on the projection, but I would draw, I would create a still life setup, draw it all from life, using the tricks that we learn in drawing one and two here, of pencil measuring, starting with contour lines, starting with objects first, then you see in the next image off to the right, um, I started factoring in the structure that the objects were on, then I would go into the underpainting, a red underpainting, um, it's actually quinacridone red, so hot pink, um, to establish values because I realized when I was painting larger scale, I was way more focused on saturated color than I was on making the shapes and objects feel dimensional. So I started to do an underpainting to help me figure that out. Um, and then I would paint color on top of that. And this, this painting that you see here, the progress or the process, um, was one of the last ones that I did my senior year. And this was one, the first one that I really tried to put meaning behind. Um, I did, I read this book about still life that again, my professor Chris came over to me and he handed me this book that said still life. And he said, as I remember it, don't just look at the pictures, actually read it, actually read the information about still lifes. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna do exactly what you said. I read it that weekend and it was really helpful for me because I didn't really realize before reading all about still lifes that like the bowl of fruit meant something, that the open book meant something, that the candle meant something. And I'm sure I learned that in art history, but you know, I, it didn't really sink in at that time frame. So with this painting, I, I tried to incorporate messages. Every object I put in there meant something to me, but I realized when I painted it that like it meant something to me, but no one else could really get that message unless they were equipped with the knowledge of object symbolism. Um, so I realized like my senior year that I really needed to figure out like what I wanted my paintings to be about and then how to maybe strip it down and um, make it come across to viewers a little bit better. I was still, again, just really figuring things out. Um, it was also at this time frame, so this was the last painting that I painted my senior year. And I, you know, I majored in graphic design, minored in painting. I knew I, was, I wanted to teach painting after I took my first painting course. I just like knew that. Um, so I, I knew I, wanted, I needed to get the MFA to teach painting. So like this painting was the last painting. Um, I painted to develop my portfolio for my MFA applications to try to get into grad school. And in undergrad, I felt like I got good grades. I got into shows. I got some awards. Um, I was, you know, I had honors. Like I had all the things on my resume. So I didn't anticipate. Um, I just thought that like, surely I get into a grad school. I didn't really think anything more of it. I just thought I've done all the things. Surely it'll work out. So I applied to 10 schools just to keep my options open, thinking like I'll, I'll, I might get into a few, you know. Um, I got rejected from every single one of them. So that for me was really difficult because I felt like, okay, I have this plan. I did all the things and I still got rejected from everything. Like now what? So um, I applied to the MA, the Master of Arts program at EIU. Um, and it was a one year program and I applied there, honestly, as kind of like a safety net because I, I didn't get into the MFA programs, but I realized as I got into this MA program that it was the best thing that could have happened to me because I was not in, uh, there's no way I could have mentally, psychologically, even physically handled what you have to handle in an MFA program. So like fresh out of undergrad, if I would have gone to an MFA program, I, it probably would have not gone well for me just because I wasn't ready there, ready to handle that mentally and conceptually with my work. Um, so I ended up getting to the MA program at Eastern. I still carried the still lifes into the MA program. This was a view of my studio. So I had this cubby system set up that I inherited from another graduate student. Um, and I painted shadow boxes so I could control lighting a little bit better. I painted all the boxes black. And you'll see throughout these little cubbies like different still life setups. Um, so it was during this time that I started reading more books about um, our society, about consumerism and materialism. Um, and I started to become interested in this balance that we have of man-made products and natural resources. And um, so I started to set up still lifes that would communicate this. 
um, to the best of my ability at this point. And I also started to work on circles. So you see in the upper right uh, circle, uh, Tondo, um, that is in progress. And the Tondo, I honestly started working on a Tondo just because I was a little bored working on a square format. I, or in a, a rectangular format, I wanted something that would be a little bit more challenging compositionally. Um, but I found that I really loved it because as I was working on these different still life setups, like you can see there's setups all around this cubby system, I could just paint multiple still lifes on one tondo and then just rotate it so I could still paint from life and I could paint from the right orientation. Um, but I didn't, I could still be a little bit more playful with the still life on the panel. All my paintings are on panel too, by the way. I don't use canvas. I don't like the way canvas gives. I like the pushback of a panel. Um, it also forces more uh, control. Panel is not forgiving at all. So you see every brush stroke, you see every layer. Um, so for those reasons, it really just helped me to develop my craft. Um, but with this work, like you can see, hopefully, um, I wish I had a little laser. You see where that like clip light is and then up to the right of that is a little still life set up on a stump or on a tree, on a, on a branch. It's kind of a big branch, but so, so that's there. The, that's these two. So I was playing around with different ways to compose the imagery on the composition. Again, like this balance of man-made and natural. Um, and I found that painting these I really started to like painting the natural things like wood more so than the um, like plastics and metals and I got I, I was kind of over painting trash pretty quickly painting this work but I really love this work um, especially when I started to incorporate different multiple still lifes in one composition. So like the, the top um, cluster of objects is one still life, and then the bottom cluster of objects is another. And then I started to make up, which is a big thing for me, because I didn't paint from memory at all. I painted from observation. So like painting strings was like, like just a foreign concept to me. So that was like really out of my comfort zone, painting strings. Even incorporating that piece of glass at the bottom was a new thing for me. So I learned a lot with this work. And um, I think the dark tondo really helped to reinforce the sense of flux um, that we have and this, like the ephemerality of objects, of um, natural resources that I was interested in at the time. So we have these clusters kind of tethered to things or coming undone from other things that we can't see as part of the imagery. Um, so my final install with my MA show I, again, I learned a lot from this, um, but I think when the show went up, I had been applying to MFA programs again, right? That was my goal, to apply to MFA programs. I had one school that I really wanted to get into. Um, so this time around, I applied to 10 schools. I got rejected from, I think, seven, and I got into, or I got interviews at three. So I had one interview that was really weird, and I ended up in tears. Granted, I'm an emotional person, so I cried a lot back in these days, but um, I, it was bad. It was like, it was one of those interviews that I, it was just something that immediately I knew like, okay, that's not the school for me because I was just, it wasn't a good experience. So I said no to them and then I had two other offers, but I just wasn't like something just really didn't feel right for me. Um, I had the gut feeling that I just wasn't sure. I finally had one of the directors of the school call me and she was like, okay, Hannah, what's the deal? We've been going back and forth for a couple weeks. What's going on? Tell me about it. And I'm just like, I don't know. I just don't feel it. it I, something just doesn't feel right in my gut. Um, and I couldn't explain it at the time, but I went with it because I figured trust your intuition, right? So I ended up saying no. So after this show went up, I was thinking like, okay, I'm going to move back to my parents' basement, right? Because I didn't get into grad school. My plans didn't work out. Um, and I think it was during this time that I've always had um, a strong faith, but I think during this time it strengthened it a lot because I realized like, okay, maybe I'm not in control of things. Maybe if I try to control things and plan things out um, it, and, and then it doesn't work out, maybe that's a sign that I should kind of like release that to a higher power. Um, so my strength started to, tr uh, my faith started to strengthen during this time frame. Um, 
And over the summer, so moved back home, moved all my stuff back home in May, and then I get a call in, at the end of July from Eastern, and he, uh, the, the person who called me said something to the effect of like, okay, Hannah, we've been interviewing for graph design. The candidates, we just don't think are a good fit right now for our program. We like you, we know you can do it. Do you want the job, kind of? There, you know, there was more said, but it was, that's kind of a summary. And so I'm thinking, okay, it's the end of July. School starts in August. This is crazy. I've never, like, I taught Introduction to Art in my MA, but that's it. And, um, but I figured, okay, the doors have opened for this opportunity. I have to say yes. So I said yes, um, worked there for two years teaching graph design, and I really started to think about, you know, I was, like, immersed in the graph design realm teaching. Um, and this is a quote by Jessica Hish. She's a letterer. And... She, like, famous quote that she said, the work you do while you procrastinate is probably the work you should be doing the rest of your life. So I started to think about that in relation to my artwork because producing these paintings, these are dark paintings, right? They're of topics that, are, that aren't really positive, right? Um, so I started thinking about maybe I should think more about painting the objects that I really liked painting during my MA, and that was like a tree stump and tree bark. So when I was teaching, I decided to just go for it and not think about content. Because um, I, for me, content, thinking about like me, the meaning of imagery just like stressed me out and then I couldn't paint because I was too worried about what it meant. So I just figured I'm just gonna paint tree stumps and not know why and just figure it out later. I'm just gonna make a bunch of paintings. So um, I started painting this tree stump, and these were all things that I had encountered in the world. So they'd be like, I saw this on campus at Eastern, it's probably still there, it just might be more decayed. Um, but I, and I was painting from photos, but I really wanted to figure out how to work with the paint to work with more abstraction in the background, work with like more realism and more texture in the foreground, so that paint would actually start to reinforce the texture of the thing itself. Um, but again, not thinking about content at all just being totally honest here. Um, and I had the opportunity to have a show with a, um, he was actually a mentor during my MA program, um, but then he turned colleague as I got hired on at Eastern. So we had a show together, so I produced these paintings for that show, so you can see kind of, and these are, this was back when I had not a great camera or a great camera phone, so this image is really pixelated. Um, so note to you guys, Take really great photos, the best that you can while now, while you're in school, and then you have them later on. Um, but yeah, all these, all these images are like tree stump, tree bark, fungus started to come into it a little bit with this painting. And this painting was one where I started it, this was the underpainting. So this is like the first layer that I did on this painting. And the, um, my professor turned colleague that I was having the show with, um, he, his name's Bo, he came into my studio and he said like, I really like that, that's working really well. And I'm like, this is the underpainting, like I, I intend to cover this all up, I want to make this realistic, you know, like I want it more detailed. But he was like, no, I really love how all these things are working, how you incorporated like this color here and then it balances out by this color over here. So I figured, okay, I could paint it realistic or I could listen to somebody who knows more than I do and leave it and see what happens. And I left it, and now it's one of those paintings that I'll probably never sell because I, I love it. And for me, it kind of opened the doors into abstraction a little bit and like what could be possible if I didn't paint every single detail of a photo or of the still life if, you know, if I was working from life. Um, so as I was painting those paintings, um, going into kind of like my second year teaching graphic design, that summer I spent up by myself in a cabin on a lake. It's a family cabin we've had forever. Really reflecting, like using the time to kind of get in touch with myself again, figure out what I wanted out of my work. I was like staring at this every single day for a whole summer. Um, and I realized that I, I loved the natural world and I, you know, I have a strong faith and the natural world put me more in touch with myself and with my faith. And I, I really wanted to, that became really important to me, and I figured if I'm going to make paintings, I need to tell my story, like what, I'd say this all the time to my painters, I'm like a broken record, but um, 
Like, what's, what's me that I can put in a painting that no one else can put in a painting because it's not, because it's like a reflection of me and who I am. Um, so I was thinking about that a lot. Also, how do I make the paintings start to um, reflect me more? I'm, I'm a detail-oriented person, but I also like to think deeply about things and think beyond things. Like, you have something and you think beyond it to different ways of connection, whether that be with spirituality or just different connections with people, relationships, um, different places. So this quote really resonated with me, um, and I thought, Okay, moving forward, I want to make sure that every single thing in my painting I have control over. I have control over the detail. Nothing feels rushed. I wanted everything to be really purposeful. If it didn't have importance to me in the painting, I was going to leave it out. Um, I just wanted to be more purposeful about everything. So, um, so this was my second year teaching. I was thinking about all this. And my second year teaching graphic design, my, again, painting professor came up to me in, like, January and said, hey, Hannah, are you applying to any grad schools this year? And I'm like, nope. <laughs> I got rejected. Like, I've gotten, like, 20 rejection letters up to this point. Like, I'm good. I have this job. I'm really loving it. I love working with graph designers. It's a lot of fun. I was just te I was teaching full-time, but only two days a week, too. So I had, like, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday to have studio time. So that was awesome for me. That was, like, I mean, that was, like, such a beautiful thing. Um, so I'm like, no, I'm good. You know, I don't, I don't need to get rejected again. I'm good. He's like, no, I think you should really apply to the school that you've been wanting to apply to. I'm like, but the due date's like next week. I don't think I can. That's a lot to get together. Like, I have to have letters of recommendation. I have to get all this stuff together. He's like, no, I really think you should. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to listen to him. I'm going to do it. So I get all this stuff together, send in my application. That's the only one I send in that year. And then I got in, and it was the University of Notre Dame that I always wanted to go to. I really wanted to work with a professor there in particular. Um, so I just applied on a whim, got in. So again, that's like me trying to plan things doesn't work. And when I don't plan it at all, when I just, you know, try really hard, cram for a week, and then apply, then it works out for me. Um, so I carried like this whole thought into grad school, and um, I I figured that like no better time to figure out what my work means than going into my MFA. Um, and I, I was really passionate about showing how I feel more connected to my spirituality, to my soul. I feel um, like a greater sense of faith out in the natural world. Um, and I wanted to figure out how to paint that, how to articulate that better. And I started by just painting kind of what I'd been painting before, tree stumps, forest undergrowth, painting from photographs again that I'd taken. And I tried to communicate, you know, this was me thinking I was really, really communicating it, I think differently now. But like, how do I like saturate the colors? How do I tweak the handling of paint to reinforce what I was experiencing in that moment? So areas become more detailed. Some areas get a little bit looser, a little bit more abstract. Um, and I really loved painting these. I tried to hone my craft even more so. I tried to make it look less photographic, more, more re like realistic, like the real thing in nature. Um, but at the end of the day, I kind of realized that it was like a painting of a cup fungus and not much beyond that. So I had to think through, like, if I want this deeper way of thinking about things, if I wanted to, the viewer to, to go beyond, to make different connections, I couldn't paint realistically anymore. It just didn't make sense because um, it, it was too much rooted in, like, the specific object itself and not, like, what's beyond that. Um, so with this painting, I like kind of eased into it. On the border, you can see like I started to incorporate a process of dissolution, mixing oil paint in with mineral spirits in the background. But still, it's, that's pretty realistic. Um, so I started doing a lot of research because I figured I have to make my work more abstract. I just had that gut feeling that I have to get out of realism. I have to get away from the photograph if I want to show how the natural world, how these like finite organisms in particular, lichens, fungi, and moss, encourage me to think beyond. Um, so I started reading about art. I started reading about spirituality. I started reading about mushrooms. I checked out 
every book I could at the Notre Dame Library, like scientific books about mushrooms, so like the big, thick, five-inch books about like lichens. I'd read them cover to cover so I could know everything there is to know about mushrooms and lichens and mosses, just because I felt like I was just painting them because I like them. I didn't know anything about them. So I started researching about them, and I realized that they are essential for our existence. And I didn't know this before. And this was before, I feel like now there's like documentaries, different people are talking about the importance of mushrooms. I feel like when I was doing this, like I hadn't heard that anywhere. So this was like a brand new concept to me that they were essential for our existence. Um, so, you know, way back when, um, just to give you the abridged version, fungi digested rock to give birth to soil, which then lets everything else happen. Um, and now they're in charge of you know, putting forests, composting things. Um, so they're an essential part of our existence, um, the cyclical nature of our existence. So after I read that, I figured like, I could make this work. I could make this into my thesis in grad school. I could figure out a way to connect the importance of mushrooms and lichen and mosses um, with, with spirituality in some way, because they both have this process of thinking beyond to greater connections besides themselves. Um, but again, this started all with research. I even met with a, an eco-theologian on campus because I was having conversations um, in the art department, and they were good conversations, but I felt like um, I wasn't able to articulate what I was feeling well. And because of that, I feel like some of the discussions weren't um, like people really weren't picking up on what I wanted out of my work. So I, I met with, uh, I reached out to different people on campus to see if I could gain insight from them. And I ended up meeting this eco-theologian um, who was really helpful for me, Celia Dean Drummond's her name. It's her book up in the middle there, that bright green book. Um, but that was a really important turning point for me in my work because she talked about um, viewing the natural world as creation, as this like magical place that's a gift. So that concept um, was, again, helpful to me to kind of bridge this like mushrooms and these finite organisms with spirituality. Um, I was looking at artists too, of course. Um, so I was looking at abstract painters, Mark Rothko, Caspar David Friedrich, Alexis Rockman. Um, so kind of going back to romantic landscape painting with Friedrich, talking about the sublime, how natu the natural world could be beautiful and terrifying. Um, and then Mark Rothko, a lot of his work, he, he wants to trigger human emotion, um, interior realities. And then with Alexis Rockman, his work goes more into the Anthropocene and projected futures than I, am ever, I was ever interested in with my work, but I love how he's combining realism and abstraction. So I, I was looking at these artists and figuring out like, okay, if these paintings, this is weird, but if these paintings like had a baby, what would that look like? Because I feel like that's what I need my paintings to, to look like, to get to my message that I want. Um, and so, you know, let me go back a slide. So first semester of grad school, you grads in here, this, this, to put this in perspective, like this was my first semester, right? And then going into my second semester, I figured I have to figure out how to paint abstractly, but I don't know how to do that. So I just decided to show how I use the natural world to meditate. And I came up with this idea that I would make one painting every day for a year to show my meditation. So by making one painting every day, I was making it so that I couldn't spend a lot of time on it because I had to paint one painting every day or more than one painting. Like you'll see in some, I painted like three a day. Um, April, you see the fourth image on the right, I painted like seven a day based on how many meditations I had. Um, so I was taking this experience that I had in the natural world, using the natural world to meditate, to connect with my spirituality. Some of these meditations would be from the sky. Some of them would be from lichens, fungi, and mosses. Um, but I would use that moment and then recreate that moment later or that my reflection of that moment. Um, so I wasn't painting from photographs anymore. I was painting with media that I was unfamiliar with. So I started painting with watercolor that I'd never used before. And then I started to incorporate like mixed media, starting with watercolor, then putting pastel on top of it, then oil paint. 
Um, so this was me taking like a big leap of faith with my work and really radically switching gears my second semester because I realized after my first semester that just wasn't working. Um, and this taught me a lot. I ended up putting these, making um, books out of these because I realized that like 365 plus paintings is really hard to show someone. So I started making books. I made a, a video meditation of this because I was working through like different ways to show paintings, like maybe to spark um, this process of thinking beyond maybe a painting wasn't the right media, maybe it needed to take another form. So I made these video meditations based on my paintings. Um, and this is on YouTube, I'm not gonna show the whole thing, I'm just gonna point out specific moments. But this goes into um, watercolor. So you can see these are like really referencing color field painters a lot of abstraction, some representation filtering back in in some areas, um, but not a lot, highly abstract. And I think this got me a little bit closer to my intended message with my work. This was again, just like different ways of showing this. Um, and with the watercolor, using different media forced me to become more abstract because one, I didn't know how to use it and therefore I didn't know how to control it. So I didn't know how to make watercolor like look like a realistic thing. So um, that, that forced me to kind of step outside my comfort zone and to work in more of abstraction. So I encourage any of you, if you, if you feel like you want to start painting more abstractly, let the medium do that for you. Figure out ways you can use the medium um, to do different things. You can see like a little bit of representation here. Um, but then at the end of this meditation, I also wanted to show what happened because I, as I was painting the series of one a days, I realized that um, it kind of wasn't enough to have in, in grad school, like I had to do more than just this like one a day ritual. So I started creating another body of work on top of this body of work that factored what I was learning from this into oil paintings. So. Um, I was taking like how I was flattening out color using saturated color, arbitrary color, um, how I was capturing these experiences and I started to factor them into oil paintings. I just wanna show you the end of this video because developing two bodies of work at the same time in grad school was really crazy for me. So I, I wanted in this video to reflect that sense of like chaos And just this process of thinking through things and, you know, the stress that can come from that. Um, but so these were the pages of the books that I made after I figured I'd end the video with that. Just to show what happens in a year. Um, but yeah, so that was 2017 that I made that. Um, and then it kind of gave birth to this other body of work with oil paintings, incorporating in color field painting. So you see like the dark panels to encourage self-reflection with moments of realism. So using like those realistic moments, those tangible moments, combining them together with moments of self moments that could lead to self-reflection by the color field. But arbitrary color, so I'd still be working from photographs to start with, to draw from, and then I'd throw the photograph away, put it to the side, um, oversaturate the colors, graphically abstract the forms, so flattening of forms. This is kind of pulling in my graphic design background too, creating this work that I kind of realized later. Um, and then with my one-a-days, one I, I had a lot of like, with the watercolor, it was like really ephemeral. Um, the colors would kind of bleed into each other. I wanted to figure out how to do that with oil paint. So I started to mix oil paint with mineral spirits, with galkide, with different mediums, so I could make it dissolve and um, transform on the panel, which then, for me, referenced what these organisms do. They, they, they kind of like eat up and decompose things, right? So I wanted to incorporate those uh, processes of dissolution and transformation on the panel itself. Um, but as I was starting to do this, dive more into abstraction with my paintings, I got really self-conscious because I felt like painting is like the one thing in life that I felt like made sense to me that I was, I was fairly confident about 
and I liked, I really liked like the technical side of painting and I was really worried that if I started painting abstractly, this is just me being really honest with you guys, like I, it would look like I didn't know how to paint anymore and I really didn't want that and I was really self-conscious about that. So I tried to figure out ways that I could still include technical painting in with abstraction um, just so I felt like I was still hanging on to that part of painting that I really loved in certain terms of like clean line work, smooth blends. Um, even in this one, I started with the background first um, and this color is wildly different on screen. It's like really yellow up there, I'm not sure why. Um, but uh, I started with the color field first, like almost like a paint pour, but I kind of went back in and edited it. And then I went on top of that with forms that were graphic. It was from a photograph, but um, I painted it to reflect my experience of that moment seeing these organisms. So I'd be abstracting it a little bit more. Um, when I was making this work, so this was like my second year in grad school, I took a trip to Alaska with my mom. I have relatives that live my aunt and uncle live up in Alaska and they were thinking that that would be a good trip for me to take because crazy stuff grows up in Alaska, right? So we went to Alaska and I was kind of thrown into the sublime wild landscape that is Alaska and seeing like how stuff is growing. It's a rainforest and I didn't realize that. So like stuff, things grow on everything up there. Like things grow on top of other things. So in these forests, wandering around these forests with my mom, trying to you know, figure out how we weren't gonna get like followed by a bear or a wolf, which did happen. Um, everything was fine, but it was really, it was really terrifying. We ended up like singing songs, walking through the forest because it was, we were trying to, you know, let the animals know that we were there. Um, so it was like this crazy experience and um, looking at the growth around, it was like a complete abstraction to me because it was so wild. I'd never seen anything like it before of like moss just covering every square inch in front of you. And then if you zoom in on details, like you see on the right, then like these little teeny tiny mushrooms are growing out of the, the, this moss. So that was like that stump that's kind of in the middle of the picture on the left. Zoom into that stump and then you'll find the mushrooms. Um, so I was taking this experience into um, grad school, thinking about like the macro versus the micro, using the finite to think about the infinite. Again, to connect that with like how I think about my spirituality, using these organisms to connect. Um, so I carried that into my thesis exhibition. Um, I started working back on circles again because tondos really for me referenced the cyclical aspects of the natural world. They referenced this way of like discovery that I was having on my trip to Alaska, even self-discovery with using these organisms to think about connecting to myself, to my own spirituality. So the circle made a lot of sense for me. I wanted to display them in a way though it also produced a sense of enchantment, of joy. A lot of times with landscape imagery, it's met with um, maybe feelings that might be more tense. I, I didn't want that for my show. I wanted viewers to feel more enchanted by seeing it and feel like there, there's a lot of hope present in the landscape as well, especially with fungus of all things, like that's like the epitome of hope. Um, so I figured I would combine them in different ways on the wall so that viewers could start to form these connections so they could kind of go on this journey of discovery that I was in in Alaska, seeing all these different organisms. So a lot of these are from my experiences seeing these organisms in Alaska. I took different pictures and then I used the picture as a very loose reference for the paintings. Some of these paintings are upstairs that you'll see. Some of them I don't have anymore. Um, but it combined, they combine realism with abstraction. So some moments are really abstract. Some moments are really realistic and really fine-tuned. Um, kind of thinking about how to combine everything that I learned throughout my MFA experience into one show. But I, as I, as I, you know, as I stepped back and reflected on this show, I realized that maybe I could have installed it a different way. So I was kind of thinking about that as I. Um, as I've, I've installed some of these paintings, like this is my second time installing them, so I've been thinking through different ways to install them to reinforce the act of discovery, connection, self-reflection. Um, but so after my um, MFA show, I took a break. I went and saw fa fr friends and family. I, um, you know, spent time at my summer cabin again. So go see stuff. 
I think that's important um, to just kind of get out of the studio. You can spend a lot of time working, but it's also important to take time to just not paint, not do studio stuff, and get in touch with yourself again, connect with other people, connect with the landscape. Um, so I went to see the Hillmoff Clint show in New York. Um, and this show, she produces paintings that are spiritually motivated paintings. And this was a spiritually designed building of the Guggenheim. So it was like this crazy experience seeing the work in this space. And this, this led me to think after grad school how to incorporate more meditation and the act of, act of like having this meditation as a as part of my work. So just different images. Because this is kind of what I'm thinking about now and with some of my recent paintings that are in the show upstairs. Um, I also got a piece of advice as I graduated my MFA program to draw more. You can draw anywhere you go. Um, so after my MFA, I was lucky enough and blessed enough to get hired here, right? Which was awesome. I'm super grateful to be here. Um, but I realized that having a, does this look okay up here? Having a full-time teaching job, I wasn't gonna be able to paint every day. So I had to figure out some way to still be creative every day, but in a way that was attainable. And I also wanted to incorporate more of like this meditation, more of this ritual aspect, more of like drawing from my mind and drawing from my heart and soul instead of drawing from a picture. So I started doing these one a night meditations. So every night for a year, my first year here, I would meditate and then I would do a sketch based on that meditation. So all of these are from life. You'll see them all upstairs. Um, and that kick-started more paintings based on those sketches. So some of them were more representational, included some iconography, some religious iconography or spiritual iconography. I also started to see um, a lot of things that hadn't been present in my paintings before, like root systems and inner networkings of things. And I love these sketches a lot, and I wanted to figure out how to incorporate them into a painting. Um, and also these, these, little, these little guys that kind of referenced the natural world, but not, you couldn't really pinpoint what exactly they were. So I started to do sketches for paintings, bigger Tondo paintings. So you can see here, just to show you into my sketchbook. Um, so this is a detail of one of them upstairs, just so you can see where the root systems started to happen. This is really dark on screen. Um, so go upstairs and see it. It's much better upstairs. Same thing here. Um, these greens are really yellow on screen. But you can see how I'm taking the sketch and then figuring out how to adapt it into a painting. Um, same thing here with systems. So this is like really referencing the Hilma off Clint show, um, seeing how she was dealing with like abstraction, thinking about different shapes and symbols to include in her works. I had all these tondos that I didn't know what to do with. I actually saved that one, that orange one at the bottom. You'll see it upstairs. But um, I wanted to incorporate them together to show cyclical aspects of the natural world. I was kind of using those to think beyond. So that turned into this. It's also upstairs. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where I'm at now with my work. Um, but I wanted to just quickly show you how I, I came up with the show upstairs, because I mentioned with my MFA show, I had circles everywhere, and um, so I felt like it, it might have been a little dizzying, like too much everywhere, so I wanted to kind of reel it in with this showing of work. So I first started with a blueprint of the gallery that you see on the upper left, and then I created a Photoshop mock-up to scale of every wall in the gallery, and I would place the paintings on them, and then I would figure out um, where each painting was on the wall in terms of inches. So I'd mock everything up. Then I actually used these little circles of circles and I printed those out to scale and hung them on the wall so I could use them to measure where to place the circle, the tondos on the wall because there was no way I was gonna make those anywhere near accurate, like in terms of a circle if I didn't have that. So I put this on the wall, I'd poke holes through the top to see where like the top of the panel would hit and then I'd use that to measure off of. So just little tricks of the trade that you guys will learn as you start to show your work. I also use a lot of tape to mark the walls, so I'm not putting a lot of pencil marks on the walls. That's a good practice to get into. Also using a level to measure with. Um, and I created a flat Photoshop mock-up of everything, and then I created an actual mock-up of 
it in the space. So I took a photo of the gallery and then, you know, transformed, warped my flat Photoshop images into the space. So this is my Photoshop mock-up, and then this is the real deal. So you can see how I kind of use that um, to gauge what the show is going to look like. Um, so yes, I'm a little OCD when it comes to my work. I want to have everything planned out from the get-go to make the install easier, run more smoothly, especially when I know I'm going to be trying to hang this while I'm teaching at the same time and trying to juggle that. It made it a lot easier. I highly recommend this. Um, so I think throughout everything, like my journey from like where you guys, a lot of you guys are at, um, to right now, the best piece of advice, unsolicited advice I know, I can give you is to be honest, make honest work. I think, like somebody said, like the weirder the better. So I think even if like you might be a little um, unsure of yourself, I say just go for it, figure out what makes you you, visualize your story, um, and draw more. You never know where, where it'll lead, even if you think, I don't draw. Draw anyway. You can do it everywhere. Also, go see stuff. Um, so right now, I took a trip out west with, uh, with an awesome group of people, and it's inspiring me a lot more these days. So my work might take a different turn here in the near future, so be ready for that. And always remember, too, that you know your plan might not work out the way you want it to, at that moment, but there's a reason for everything. It just means usually if you get that rejection letter that something else is gonna work out that's better. Um, so always keep perspective. You know, you can't have rainbows if you don't have storms, right? All right, thank you. If you have questions or want to reach out to, and you feel like too shy to ask questions in this, which I totally get being a shy person, reach out to me, email, Instagram, check out my website. Also come up and ask me questions. If you have questions. Yeah. The MFA is a Master of Fine Arts. So it's the terminal degree in the arts, similar to what a PhD would be in another program. Um, and you usually get an MFA to teach at a collegiate level. Where the Master of Arts, the MA that I got first, is just a one-year program that you can teach at a community college. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. <laughs> Selling work. Uh, so we have a student. We had a student show, just like you guys have in undergrad. And you, you put work in the show, and you put a cost on it for insurance value. I didn't think anything would sell, so I didn't even like think anything of it. And and then two, of, I think it was like two, maybe one or two of them sold. And it was before I knew that like that was even a thing. So I had like I was just kind of thrown into it. So I think in that moment, it was really hard because I thought like, well, I don't want to sell this painting. Like, I really like this painting. I want to keep it, but it was already sold. So I figured like, okay, I'm probably going to make a lot more paintings. I might not even remember this in another 10 years. I'm just going to sell it. So I think even though that came as a bit of a shock, it was a good thing because it just kind of like made me okay with letting work go. I do have my paintings that I'm not going to sell um, to like that that um, that fungus or I have this painting and I don't know if Chris Kaler if Chris will listen to this um, at some point but just to show you so that painting on the far right I, I he won't even remember this probably but he came up to me and like did a little tester on it and like painted on it and I kept it I like didn't he's like you know work back into this and touch it. I'm like nope, I'm going to save it because you did it and it's magical and I'm saving it. So I think like for that reason, like I'm never selling that one either. So I do have my paintings that I'm not going to sell, but I think overall, like I want people to experience my, I want to get my work out there and like if it resonates with people, like I want them to have it, you know, except for that painting. <laughs> um, let me get back to the end. Other questions? Yeah.
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So um, my faith comes into my work be- from like like the roots. My work's driven by my faith and my sense of connection. Um, I think with my work, developing my work at Notre Dame, I was very aware that I didn't want it to become proselytizing in a way. So I wanted to be respectful of that, you know, there's a lot of different type of faith. You can believe in God, you can just believe in a higher power, you cannot believe in any of that. And I wanted to be respectful of that. So I, I chose not to make that an explicit part of my work because I felt like that was the driving force behind my paintings and why I produce my paintings. Um, is because I feel that really deep faith and spiritual connection with the landscape, but like the connection with the landscape was what was the most important thing for me to communicate with my work. Um, So I think that's where it came in. I think in the future I might, you know, who knows where it'll lead, Um, but I think for my work it's more just driven by that. Um, And then also with faith comes creation, right? It, with the way I believe anyway, um, like believing that God created this thing that we live on, and that's where ecotheology comes into play. Um, ecotheology is that like that really our the natural world creation is a gift from God, and we should treat it with respect because it's a gift, right? So if we view it as more of a gift, then we're more likely to treat it with respect. Um, and that idea is really compelling to me. And I worked with that a little bit in my grad experience um, with my work. But again, it was more of like the driving force behind everything and something that I didn't want to make explicit in the final work because I didn't want it to become proselytizing in a way. I want to be respectful of people. Yeah. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then I saw a hand over here and then so Alyssa. a work of art like did you constantly have a feeling of like I'm excited to do this I can do it every day or were there days where it was a job (laughs) both I was super excited at first um but then I started the second body of work and then I realized that like holy cow this is a lot of work to do all at once um so I cheated a little bit I didn't cheat a lot but I did sometimes where I would, I have this journal, I should have showed the journal, I have this journal that I wrote down every day and like the, what I meditated on. And I, then if I didn't have time to do that painting that day that I would catch up. So sometimes I was like three days backed up. So then I just play catch up. Um, with my one a nights though, because I cheated in grad school with my one a night drawings, I didn't cheat at all. So I remember like taking a road trip with friends out west and we got to where we were going at like 3 a.m. and unpacked the van that we were traveling in, in the house, get inside, and it's like 3 a.m. I'm thinking, man, I am tired. We've been on the road for like 16 hours. The last thing I want to do right now is a sketch. But I figured like, nope, this is my thing. This is my process. I'm sticking to it. I don't want to cheat. I'm doing it. Um, And I did it, but I think it's like sheer willpower. And you always feel better after you do it too. Kind of like exercise. You might not want to go for a walk, but you usually feel better after you do. Kind of the same thing. But it's a really good practice. I highly recommend it. But it is a lot. Question? Yeah. Yeah, I really liked your (coughs) example with the cabinet at the beginning. And something that I'm kind of looking at in my own education is I'm trying to learn more about being working on the creative aspect of the things I do um, because it, it's easy to sit down and practice processes and sit down and think of technical things. Um, but what's your best advice on really going at something, maybe something abstract and giving it creative meaning or, or thinking about just the overall that creative side of like the, the what is seen in a piece? Like how to attach meaning to what you make is that what you mean i think so with sort of when things get a bit more abstracted i I suppose yeah Yeah. um i i think the thing that helped me the most was to read about abstraction read about the history of painters and why abstract painters like the um in uh like 
why why they painted the way that they were painting and what they wanted to do with their paintings. Um, and also think about like when you're dealing with abstraction, you're dealing with formal qualities of art making, right? So you're dealing with color, you're dealing with shape, line, form, all of that has meaning. So you can start looking into color symbolism, even how a curving line, a, an organic line makes you feel differently than like something with jagged edges. Um, so kind of think about the meaning, the metaphorical associations of formal qualities of art. But I think first, I would read a book about abstraction. Like there are a lot of like really great survey books out there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, we're going. Oh. I have a question from the chat. Okay. Which is uh, would you consider making prints of your paintings? Have you ever done printmaking? I would love to do more printmaking. I love printmaking. I love that in undergrad. Um, I so that's something that like I definitely want to get into. I don't know how at this point but I really want to make printmaking happen. Life is long, right? So I can experiment with that in the future. But I love linoleums. Like, I love that carving aspect of it. Um, that was like, I, yeah, I would love to get into that. Um, making prints of my paintings, though, no. Oil paint is very rich. It's really luminous. If you make a print of an oil painting, it's never going to look the way it does in life. Um, so for me, strictly, I'm like very very particular about that no absolutely not no paintings no prints of oil paintings watercolor um a medium that ha doesn't have like that rich luminosity that oil paint does maybe uh but right now no you gotta buy the real deal folks <laughs> hope <laughs> sorry i know some of your names i hope that's not weird you really want to learn how to paint still lifes, but you have no experience, you just got to go for it. You, you learn by doing, right? Even if you're in like a painting class, I think that can be really helpful to point you in the right direction. But I think for me anyway, like I learn the most by just doing it and kind of figuring it out and figuring out what works best for you. Um, you could start by using monochromatic palette. So use one color, focus on value, light and shadow, and then put color on top of that. Um, you could also start with like a limited palette. So I have students in painting to make a full color still life, but just with red, yellow, and blue. So they really learn color mixing. So you could start there too. Kind of like what we're doing in Visual Foundations, right? But I think you just got to do it. You just got to go for it. Make everything. Make one of every idea that you have and then see what happens. That's my advice. <laughs> I think you don't, you don't really know what direction you want to go until you just go in every direction and then you can figure it out. And usually by, so I tell like some of the students in painting, if you're in between two ideas, do a sketch of each idea and usually just by like the act of doing that sketch or making that painting, doing that drawing, you'll either start to really love it or maybe you might be kind of over it after you paint the painting and then you can go another direction. But I think it is one of those things that you, you just got to try them all and see what happens. Works on paper, sketches, drawings. That might not be the answer that you want, that you're looking for, but that's my advice. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah? Tondos. Tondos. T O N D O S. Tondos. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. I like that one. That one's a gem. I like them all, though, but yeah, I, there are my favorites for sure. Anything else? 
You guys had some really great questions. I'm happy you had questions. That's great. And hopefully, just as, as a disclaimer here at the end, I taught all day, so I hope all that made sense. I don't really know what happened right there, but. <laughs> all right, good. Thanks, all.